all those questions are in your head, at least subconsciously, when you make any communication. And that was the case in, in, in France, too, though perhaps less complicated, because as complicated as, uh, as um, Darton's diagram is, if we tried to diagram uh, uh, what's going on with you, it would be a lot more complicated. In fact, we did some of this with our graduate students last year, and there was a couple I should put in the diagram. So one, one, one student did this extraordinary diagram, which is all these boxes and arrows and so on and so forth to get a sense of how she... But I think it was the same issue, the, the, the budget crisis, how she communicated about that. If you had to do this, it would be really a complicated uh, exercise. We will not answer you. Um, so in effect, all technologized cultures uh, are multimedia. And in particular, when we're looking at something like public opinion, this is something we'll come back to, um, we have to understand that it arises out of the intersection of these different forms, some public and some private. Um, John uh, um, uh, Dewey um, uh, wrote, um, the philosopher of the early 20th century, um, speaking of public opinion, wrote the vision is a spectator, hearing is a participator, publication is partial, and the public which results is not, this is Dewey's kind of prose, uh, is partially informed and formed until the meanings it pervades pass from mouth to mouth. The idea here being in the early 20th century, you know, you read something in the newspaper, it doesn't mean anything until you've talked it over with your friends and know what they're thinking. And similarly about the Berkeley budget crisis, what chance of burning out, you know, what, what, you, what you saw in a, in a, uh, in a, um, uh, uh, a message, uh, uh, an email message, didn't mean a lot to you unless you talked it over with friends or on any of the media we're talking about, which you, where you formed your opinion uh, about it. Quick story, um, many years ago, uh, I worked at a research center, Paul worked there too, in, in Palo Alto, the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, and, and um, uh, it was the day of the uh, OJ verdict. And uh, I was driving to, uh, to work and listening to the, waiting for the verdict to come in over the radio and so on. I walked into the building and they hadn't come in yet. So I said, oh, you know, they've got it on the TV up, upstairs in the cafeteria. Um, so I walked up to the cafeteria and there were a bunch of people, a few uh, researchers uh, and some of the kitchen uh, people. Uh, the researchers mostly white or uh, Asian, the kitchen people mostly black or Hispanic. And when the verdict was announced, uh, the kitchen people all applauded and uh, the researchers didn't. I mean, whether they thought it was a good idea or a bad idea, they weren't. And it struck me, you know, here's this television show that's been going on for a year every day that everybody's been watching. We've all been watching the same thing, taking the same information and so on and so forth. Um, and our evaluation of it is completely different because when we, after we watched it, we talked it with other people and formed different opinions about what was going on. So it's, it's important to realize that print culture, uh, to speak of print culture is to ignore, in a sense, all of the work that's done by the oral culture or the informal culture, let me say, that, that goes on underneath it. Um, in the uh, 18th century and the 17th century, uh, there emerged these new contexts for informal communication. Um, one, uh, the Salon, uh, more important uh, in uh, continental Europe than in um, Great Britain. <coughs> no. But these are these... Uh, you know, if you were um, uh, an aristocratic hostess um, kind of on the make socially, you might form a salon and invite other aristocrats and um, <coughs> also a bunch of writers and artists. And the idea being, or the conversazione was sometimes called it, using Italian word, the idea being to have a kind of brilliant uh, conversation that would, on the one hand, be the source of gossip and bleep and all these other things that Darton talks about. Um, and uh, be, be, on the other hand, the, the, the room that everybody wanted to, to, uh, to, to get into in, uh, in, in Paris. The same thing, until a few years ago, at least, existed in, um, uh, in, in Washington. Uh, there were people who, um, who had salons, just, just like that. Um, in, uh, in the UK, in, in, uh, it wasn't the UK, in Great Britain, um, it was more a question of, uh, of this coffee house society that you read about in the, in the reading. Um, as um, uh, Abel Boyer, a French uh, uh, observer, writing about Britain in the um, uh, early 18th century, um, uh, he says, well, we don't really have salons and uh, academies and, uh, and more, more formal uh, People just meet in the coffee houses or, or private clubs, but the, the coffee houses in particular, uh, or, in, or in taverns. Um, and uh, as a broadside poem, um, a broadside we'll talk about in one of these handbills that were handed out. It was an early printed form of, of uh, distribution of news. Uh, coffee is this loathsome potion, not yet understood. Syrup of soot and essence of old shoes. Uh, we have coffee like that today, too. Um, they asked with diurnals. Diurnals are, are newspapers are, uh, and the books of news. News books. Uh, are you talking about news books at any point? Um, well, you, maybe I'll have you talk about it more. You know more about the news books than I do. It's, it's an antecedent of the newspaper. Um, um, <coughs> in theory, at the coffee house, we were all the same. Uh, the, uh, the lord and the, uh, and the, and, and, and the, uh, the butcher. Um, my, all the butcher probably weren't coming here. But uh, the distinctions of class uh, were going to be, at least in theory, um, uh, ignored. Mechanic was a, like a working man or a, a skilled laborer, a carpenter or something like that. Um, and everybody was, uh, was going to sit there and talk about the affairs of the day. Uh, there's uh, now being entered, having come into the coffee shop, there's no need of compliments or gentle greeting. Uh, gentle greeting is high birth. Uh, for you may sit uh, anywhere, there's no respect of persons there. That's anybody can, can sit and, and, and participate. And the, the conversation um, was explicitly uh, very often political. At a time, I mean, this is the middle of the, uh, the, uh, the 17th century to the end of the 17th century, a period, and then earlier in the 18th century, a period of intense and, and violent political life uh, in Great Britain and France and most of these countries. Um, uh, <coughs> and, uh, so much so that the, um, uh, the uh, monarchy became a little bit alarmed. Uh, Charles II actually tried to close them down. Uh, it wasn't uh, very successful. Um, they said, well, they're all spreading these rumors and scandals reports. Of course, in France, they have the, as you saw in Darton, they have the police running around taking down notes on uh, uh, who said what in the taverns. Um, not very good for the people then, but very happy for the historians now, like Darton, because they can go back and get all these secret police reports and find out what was going on. Um, Andrew Marble, um, the poet, um, people know Marble? Uh, had we but the world enough in time? Is this world ever? Um, uh, uh, who writes, when they take from the people the freedom of words, they teach them the sooner to fall to their swords. Don't let it forbid us to talk. We'll, we'll go get our swords. We'll, we'll revolt. Uh, let, them drink let the city drink coffee and quietly groan. They that conquered the father won't be slaves to the son. What's the reference to in English? We have a couple things. I don't want you to answer. What's the They that conquered the father. Late 17th century. Who's the father? What happened to him? He was the king. What happened to him? Well, the Doris Revolution was a later, but the... Uh, the, the, the no, that's, that's, that's a little later. Uh, that, that's, uh, that, that happened actually to, uh, yeah, that did happen to, uh, to Charles II, but, uh, or to, uh, to James, but um, uh, uh, what happened to Charles, the, Charles I? Okay. What happened? Yeah, he was beheaded. Um, uh, he, he was conquered indeed uh, by, by Cromwell. And his, uh, his, uh. So, <coughs> uh, in, the, um, in these coffee houses, there arose a kind of informal society of people um, who were uh, called, style themselves the virtuosi. Um, um, uh, these were, by and large, fairly wealthy, well-born people um, who, um, 
<coughs> did a great deal of travel, well, who, who, uh, who collected uh, odd things, who took an interest in science, who were amateurs. But you have to understand that most of the activities uh, that today are professional, like science and so on, so were begun by amateurs. There wasn't a job description. You know, people didn't put a job description in the newspaper saying, we're looking for scientists or biologists or something. You did it because you had money and time on your hands, and this was a kind of hobby. And science, like a lot of other things, was the invention of, of, of these people. Um, they called themselves virtuosi. It was a period of, um, well, throughout the, the 17th and 18th century, there was this passion for Italy. You finished your studies, uh, you went off uh, with, uh, with several friends and your, um, uh, your uh, a few servants um, to, uh, to visit Italy. You uh, had your coach carry over the, the Alps, perhaps. Um, you went to Venice. Venice was the Vegas. Of, uh, of the late 17th, early 18th century. They kept lengthening Carnival. It was originally like 30 days and 50 days. I think it was six months at the peak of the 18th century. There were something like 15,000 licensed prostitutes. There's an expression, this is not relevant to the prisons. Uh, expression they still, I still hear in Italy as well. Uh, um, uh, Inglese Italianizzato, Diavolo Incarnato, the in italicized Englishman is the devil incarnate, and, and they were. Um, and they came back. Um, you know, with, with various social diseases, usually, but also with um, uh, with all sorts of items they had bought, with paintings, and um, if they were of a scientific bent, uh, with, <coughs> um, uh, as uh, Mary Aspel says, um, uh, with. Um, uh, uh, pebbles and shells and wasps and spiders and caterpillars, all sorts of odd things. If you had money enough, you would send your agents to buy these things in, in foreign capitals and send them. And you would assemble them. Again, you have a large house now, large uh, 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 in a room uh, where you artfully arrange them by resemblance and so on. That was called uh, a wunda, uh, a wunda kama or a cabinet of curiosities. We'll talk about these in, 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 in another point. You didn't have that, that much money. You had a, 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 an actual kind of piece of furniture with drawers and so on and so forth, in which you, you put all these things uh, or, or, or display. <coughs> Because uh, to, to demonstrate your interest in, in, in natural, the natural world. Now, this was pre-Linnaeus. This was not biologically taxonomized and so on and so forth. Um, but these were uh, the ancestors, direct ancestors, of our modern museums. Uh, people would, I mean, you, you and I couldn't come in there, but your uh, aristocratic friends could and look at these things and you, you, you talk about them and so forth. And it was, it, it was quite the thing uh, to do. And they called themselves virtuosi. Um, uh, the virtuoso being uh, a learned person. Uh, it comes from the, uh, the same root as, as Vira, or man. Um, as, uh, again, as a linguist. Um, there was a series of words like this borrowed into English in the 17th and 18th century, virtuoso. Then in the early 18th century, there was a club in London called the Dilettanti. Dilettanti were people, dilettants were people. But it's from the Italian word for uh, delight. You know, people did things just for delight. Amateurs, another word that becomes popular. And then later in the century, uh, still another word for the Italianized fops, who wore elaborate uh, Italian clothing and, and large hats and so on. This word is one you all know because it figures mightily in uh, the story of American history. The Italian word borrowed into English for fops. You have an elaborate hat, maybe with a feather in it. I give it to you. Stuck a feather in his hat and called it macaroni, which is what these people were called. Um, so, um, alongside of um, the, the growth of science, which Paul has or will talk about, yeah, um, uh, you have this, this general growth of, of, of people who are, who are interested in, in, in learning. They will be the basis um, for a lot of the developments that we'll see later in some, some of the next time, uh, these people. But in particular, the museum is going to grow out of these, uh, of these uh, activities in addition to science. Um, it's a period in which the use of print is growing very rapidly. Um, people uh, are acquiring, again, you have to have the money to do it, but you're acquiring more and more books. Um, uh, uh, in, uh, in the 15th century, um, the late 15th century, after the uh, invention of print, uh, a learned and uh, well-to-do person might have 50 books in, in, in his library. Uh, by the time of Montaigne, and this is an exceptional person, a large personal library would be 1,000 books. Um, uh, by the 18th century, you might have 3,000 books. Again, you're, you're not some just ordinary cobbler who might have a, a few books. Um, the, um, the shift uh, goes along with what's called a shift from intensive to extensive reading. Um, it's a distinction historians have made that's now a little confused. In, uh, you're going to talk about it uh, in, uh, like, But the, the, the basic idea is that you used to read a few books a lot, like the Bible. You just you had five books and you just read them over and over again. And by the end of the 18th century, people are reading uh, a lot of books more superficially. Um, now, as Blake will explain, it's not that simple, but uh, when, when the distinction was first introduced in the history, it looked like it was. Um, uh, the sale of newspapers increases enormously. I'll come to that in a second. Um, and there is um, uh, an increase in the number of just printed genres, types. Of, you've got printed posters, theater bills, newspapers, handbills, tickets, marriage certificates, all of these different forms of, um, of, uh, um, <coughs> of, of printed objects. Can I put this in here? Um, so you're seeing all the... I'm going to jump from... Um, the, I'm just stuck in some slides at the last minute. I'm not sure if you're going to fit or not. But um, uh, you're seeing all these new printed forms, things that we don't really think much about. I mean, we think about print, we think about books and newspapers and a few things like that. Um, but in fact... Uh, there are large numbers of these other forms, like chapbooks and broadsides. These are these cheap publications that are sold for a penny uh, that may have ballads about the affairs of the day or scabrous uh, 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 stories about the, the high and the mighty, um, uh, stories about the, the sensational stories about the criminals and the executions. Um, an interesting, interesting feature of this in particular is, is, is the notion of the poster in public writing. Um, you can think of, of writing as being of two sorts. Um, uh, there's an Italian historian called Armando Petrucci who talks about this. There's bibliographic writing, an odd use of that word. I mean, just writing books. And there's epigraphic writing. It's writing on walls. Um, in, um, I'll come back to this. in classical antiquity, uh, epigraphy, writing on walls, is enormously important. Um, uh, if you're the emperor, you, uh, you post your, uh, the, 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 Paul talked about this, I think, you, you post um, your achievements on, on walls. Uh, Caesar did it, uh, the Acadirna, the first newspaper, uh, posting on walls. Or there's the writing on the entablatures of buildings, uh, the inscriptions and so on and so forth that we know. But there was much more of it um, that hasn't survived. If you, uh, if you were a prostitute in ancient Rome, the dusty streets, you had a, on your, the bottom of your, your shoe, uh, you might have your name, uh, to, so that you walk, it would be stamped in the sand, you know, for a good time, call it Ripina, you know, whatever. So. Um, uh, <coughs> uh, this more or less disappears in the Middle Ages. Um, partly because literacy is lower, but, and partly because there are no public spaces and for various reasons, but there's virtually no epigraphic writing uh, in this period. It's a very unimportant form. And it reappears um, in the Renaissance when people begin to um, deliberately copy the classical forms. These are Renaissance uh, epigraphs on Renaissance churches and so on, but, and they're familiar to you, but they're, and they're deliberately taken from the, the Roman classical models, the idea being now that writing uh, is again a, a public form. Um, in fact, it, it reached the point where in the Renaissance book, uh, if you wanted to indicate that this was really a public document, something for the public and important, um, in the front of the book, the first page of the book, you put uh, an image of the title on an image of a classical entablature. Um, um, and in modern, in modern life, um, you
uh, is just this mass of texts everywhere you go, signs and signs on shops and signs on the sidewalk and street signs and so on. And just in the course of moving around the world, you're moving through this, this world of text. And in a certain sense, um, um, <coughs> you can think of, you can ask yourself if the internet is, is, a, is more bibliographic or epigraphic. I mean, think of the way we talk about posting things. Uh, on, on the internet, as if we were posting, putting up a poster. If you go to the uh, homepage of the New York Times, um, you're going to see all these advertisements there. Are they posted? Are they like the advertisements uh, uh, posted on the, on, on the walls of buildings? Are they more like circulars? Or are they something else? Is that distinction no longer uh, a relevant way to think about things? Um, it's also the period uh, in which uh, the periodical press uh, begins to emerge. Um, the earliest newspapers, um, some people, uh, uh, I think it's uh, the, the written news, the Notizia Scritte, in Venice uh, in the 16th century. Uh, a gazetta, a gazetta is, a, is a coin. Um, um, in fact, the, uh, the newspaper in, um, in, uh, in Bologna is called... Uh, Still, the resto del Carlino, the, the, the change from the Carling, the Carlino, which was a coin, you know, it's, it's a name from the dates of the 17th century. And other newspapers in um, other parts of Europe, um, <coughs> in, uh, in, uh, in England, uh, the Caranto, uh, 1622, and in other parts of England as well. Um, do you want to talk about these, Paul? These are your slides. Yeah. Okay, let's skip it, let's skip it. Uh, newspapers emerge, um, uh, and, um, uh, and the government's taking interest in this. Um, uh, this fellow on the, on the left, we'll, we'll talk about again at one or two points, uh, um, Lord Harley. Um, the Earl of Oxford uh, is the, uh, the, the prime minister in the, the beginning of the 18th century. Um, and he's not, he knows these newspapers are out there saying things, and rather than um, suppressing them, he just pays um, uh, a few journalists to write stories um, uh, on behalf of the government, uh, among them Defoe and Swift, uh, who are not above, uh, above such things. It's a practice, and of course, has completely disappeared in, uh, in, in, in modern life. Um, also, the periodical press. Um, the, um, <coughs> uh, these are sort of the ancestors of the modern magazine, um, notably the Tatler uh, and the Spectator, um, which appear in the beginning of the 18th century, um, uh, published under pseudonyms, but they are uh, Richard Steele and Joseph Addison, important writers, and they're sort of the, the progenitors of the modern English essay, uh, you would call them. Um, uh, and also, uh, these also are being read uh, intensely in the, um, in the uh, uh, coffee houses, uh, where everybody's reading newspapers. The, the, uh, the Spectator uh, probably had a, um, uh, a circulation of about 2,000 or 3,000, um, but Addison estimated uh, that, uh, probably with exaggeration, that each copy was read by something like 50 or 60,000 people, um, because it would go into the, the coffee houses and, and, and people would read it there. Um, all Englishmen, says Artists of Swiss uh, Observer writes in 1726, are great newsmongers. Workmen habitually begin the day by going to coffee rooms in order to read the latest news. I've seen shoe blacks and men of that class club together to purchase a farthing newspaper. And of course, when people um, start to read newspapers, they begin to have ideas about the news. Uh, and um, uh, as, uh, as uh, someone else writes in, uh, in 16, uh, another observer writes in 1695, uh, they often think themselves better than the town mayor because they think they know a lot more than he does about every matter of state. People start to get uppity and get ideas. And so on. This, this public opinion begins to emerge, um, not to everybody's uh, satisfaction. Um, there is, in fact, in this period what people call a reading revolution. There's a passion uh, for reading in Europe, particularly in the late 18th century. Um, a, 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 a German uh, uh, essayist writes that readers of books rise and retire to bed with a book in their hands, sit down at a table with one, have one lying close by when working. How many of you feel this describes you at some point in your life? Yeah. Yeah, a few hands shyly going up. Yeah, a few more. Yeah, sort of How many of you have, have, have read under the covers with a flashlight when you were? Uh, about half. Yeah. The rest are not admitting it. No. Um, no lover of tobacco or coffee, no wine drinker or lover of games can be as addicted to their pipe bottle games or coffee table as those many hungry readers are to their reading habit. This is, again, something that is it's, it's a common affliction, uh, if you want to call it that, but it begins in this period. Um, um, news. Uh, we think of as a... I brought my newspaper. People have seen one of these? No. They used to come uh, uh, Defoe, uh, writing in uh, 1722, we didn't have printed newspapers to spread rumors and reports, uh, but we got them from merchants' letters and um, <coughs> um, uh, word of mouth by, by the means, um, uh, some of the means that Darton uh, talks about. It's interesting to imagine what it would be like to live in a world without news, um, to live in a world where the only way you're going to hear about something that happens far away is if you happen to hear somebody tells you about it, or you get a letter from somebody, but there's no, there's no source of news, and, and no way to know whether what you're hearing from somebody is true or not, no way to independently verify. It really isn't until the 19th century that you can trust what you read in these, in these newspapers or these, these, these things, at least when it comes to things like, you know, who won the Super Bowl. Uh, the sort of things we take for granted, uh, had to take shape uh, in this period. Um, the newspaper itself um, has a number of features. If you think about this thing, um, it's, uh, it's a periodical. What does that mean? Um, it means it comes out every... Um, uh, it's a serial, right? There's one and another and another and another. So the New York Times, there's a series of them. Um, it's uh, a periodical. It comes out, in this case, every day or every month or every quarter or every year, but, but it comes out in regular. You know when it's going to come out. Um, uh, <coughs> it's, uh, it, it, it's current. At least it pretends to be, you know, to be describing what's happening now or relative to that, relevant, what's relevant to the period in which it comes out. Um, it uh, offers itself as independent, uh, as something not issued by the court or whatever, but it's an independent uh, point of view about, uh, about what's going on. And then um, the names of many of these newspapers reflected that. Um, uh, the Current, uh, for example, in the early, in the early newspaper, reflecting the, the idea of currency. The Observer, the Spectator, the Guardian, all reflecting the idea of independence. It speaks with a certain voice. Uh, in the case of Addison Steele and the Spectator, this newly informal voice, the informal conversational, by their standards, essay uh, that, that we're familiar with, uh, on the op-ed page, is, is invented in this, in, in this period. Um, it purports to be authoritative, 